Good morning. morning. Expanding opportunities. It's all about know-how. As we transform communities through ideas and design, focusing on education, on the economy, and inclusion. As we look at this, we realize that we have societal blind spots that get in the way of how we're going to invent the future and live within it. Because the first hundred years of this nation was built on who could have the biggest and most efficient farm. The next hundred years is about who could have the biggest and most efficient factory. But the hundred years we're in now is about ideas. Who has the best ideas? And in fact, as we look, move from the agrarian to the industrial and on into the knowledge age, what we typically think is that we're going to find those ideas by looking from where we've been. And that's exactly the wrong way to look at it because we cannot view tomorrow's issues through the lens of yesterday. In fact, as we look and plan for the future, we plan from it. As we take a look at that, one that brings then about ideas. Where do ideas come from? There are lots of first order ideas and as we think about them and start sharing them with somebody else, all of a sudden a second order idea comes about and another the second order idea and a third second order idea and as these ideas start to grow, they're more, the second order ideas are more powerful than the first order ideas. When they grow up to the third level idea, what we call a third order concept, they become very powerful and can be transformative information, integration, transformation. We look at the three focus areas of education, economy, and inclusion within which we're organized around, and we realize that each one of these in their themselves are extremely complex, and people study them and wander around within them wondering, what is it that we have here? But when actually, when we look at the combination of these, where these integrate, where education integrates with the economy or with inclusion, or how inclusion can impact the economy, all of a sudden we see nether order concepts and so forth as how they're playing themselves out. But likely, when we hit that bullseye, that sweet spot of transformation, we have the opportunity to generate first, second, and third order you know, development and work as well. We look at the traditional visible economy of where we've come from and the whole area of extraction where we extract ore or oil or we harvest things like uh, wheat and trees and we uh, sell those raw materials and make some money out of them. That was the traditional economy. Then a little magic thing calls add value to that. In other words, we might call it manufacturing. And we take that ore and we turn it into steel, or we take those trees and turn them into two by fours, and we have something called primary processing, the first level in manufacturing. We can sell that for a larger dollar. But if we move on up the value train, tra chain to fabrication, we realize here that it's a lot better to sell iPads than computer chips or combines and automobiles than steel ingots and we get the large dollar coming out of that. That's the traditional economy we've often, you know, and we have all experienced. But when we look at the invisible economy, Things that are working at the info, nano, bio area, we can't see these things, but they're extremely exciting, and each one of them at their first level are very, very powerful, and in fact, they're exploding. For instance, we look at this information technology one, and uh, it's it reached a point where they say it's flowering meaning it's impacting everything that around us. In fact, uh, earlier this uh, a month ago my, was my 53rd wedding anniversary, and my wife gave me this anniversary card. There's more computing capacity in this card than there was in the world in 1950. So you start to see the flowering of these opportunities, and the same thing is happening with biotechnology, with you know, genetics and genome work and protein sequencing and so forth. Last we are seeing with the nanotechnology, working at the billionth of a scale, each one of these in their own sense are extremely powerful and continuing to grow. But when we look at the integration of things like how nano integrates with information technology, we get something like smart dust, which is an RFID chip on a dust particle. And you know, it's a smart, it computes, it transforms information and so forth. Or we have something like biosteel, where we've taken the gene out of the embryo of a spider, when it makes a spider web out of, and inserted it into the embryo of 
of a goat. And in the milk of the grown goat, then, is the same enzyme, and we can mass produce this biosteel, which is five times stronger than Kevlar, more resilient than steel. We start to see brand new things opening up. And likewise, with the uh, intersection or and uh, how information technology and biotechnology come together. Incredible things where we're influencing the code in the cell to sell, tell the cell what to do. But that's nothing compared to the bullseye here when we start to see the transformation where all three of these are working together. Things like the nanostethoscope, where we can listen to the sound of an individual cell and an individual cell sounds differently than a cancerous cell. In fact, a primary cancer cell sounds differently than a secondary cancer cell. And the Robard Institute in Canada is building a library of all the cancer cell sounds as they come about. Or the cancer assassin, this little teeny weeny little nano robot that is so small you can't see it because it's built at the billion scale. It's running around in your bloodstream. And it's out there seeking a cancer cell. And when it senses it, it kills it like a sniper, not what we have now with the hand grenade going off inside of us with chemotherapy and radiation and so forth. And then, of course, the programmable tattoo. What a wonderful development. <laughs> it's the watchless watch. I don't have to wear it on my wrist, but I just got this tattoo and it's keeping time. Well, now if I've got sensors inside that tattoo, so it's monitoring my heart rate, my blood pressure, maybe my insulin count is starting to get a lot of, out of balance. And I'll get a little red dot beeping on the inside of my wrist. These are the kinds of things that are happening in the invisible economy. And as we start to see how the invisible economy answers questions to the visible one, we realize that we have a really interesting kind of future because with the invisible economy, these things are self-replicating, actually. They build themselves. So as so you look at an education to foster inquiry, foster innovation, foster prosperity, we're going to need a different kind of education in the future. Not the one that was built on the lens of looking where we came from, but looking from the ideas and designing it for themselves. And one of the things to support these kinds of developments is this great ability in science, technology, engineering, and math. And we've framed this under something called STEM. STEM education. It is so important, not that the humanities aren't, but if we're going to be on the front edge and doing the, and leading the world in these kinds of developments. Where does STEM come from? How do we break it out? How do we format that? Well, if we look at the domains of knowledge, the big chunks of knowledge, and look at them from a large scale, the way a philosopher would look at them, Alfred North Whitehead says it this way, that there are just four major kinds of knowledge. There's the sciences, the humanities, and the technologies. And then there's another form of knowledge, which we call formal knowledge, which is logic and mathematics, and it's how we manipulate the other kinds of three parts of knowledge. But knowledge is knowledge for knowledge's sake. How do we em employ that for all the change that's going on? We do that through an adaptive system, which is a different kind of knowledge. An adaptive system, as the sociologists say, there's only three ways we adapt as a society. We adapt ideologically, sociologically, and technologically. And we do that in the built and natural environment. That's it. Those three, and it isn't random, it's systematic. So we, we use the, the general systems model to continually get better and better and better as we're doing these sort of things. And as they look at these three major areas, the ideological systems are basically our worldviews, our values, our norms. It controls the way we think and the way we act. The sociological ones is how we get organized, like in government, education, building companies, and so forth. And the technological one is expanding the human potential to harness those kinds of things. It's interesting in the fact we see how knowledge is organized, because here's another lens. For instance, the uh, domains of knowledge are knowledge. But as they interact with the, uh, with the systems over here, they permit us to you know, adapt much better. And as we learn new things and adapting, it goes back into the domain of knowledge. Out of the domains of knowledge, academia has organized these around disciplines. 
So in the uh, STEM areas of science and technology, we've organized them around physics and chemistry and biology, electromechanical, et cetera. But that's not how you organize knowledge around changing things. You organize that systematically. So we have things like communication systems, transportation systems, biological systems, and we end up with a grand matrix of how we can build and pull out of this knowledge base. So we have the disciplines to pull from, but it's the systems that does the work and then events tomorrow. But we have a different way of thinking as well as we look at this. This is one area where we really have a blind spot because as we look at the scientific method, everybody understands that one where we state the question, we develop hypothesis, we design and conduct an experiment, we observe, gather data, draw inferences, we build a new theory or law, or we come back and we replicate the research to create its reliability and validity and so forth. And uh, what comes out of that is to know something new. It's to know that. That's so different than technological design, completely different way of thinking. Rather than state the question, we identify a want or a need. And so we identify that want or need, we imagine alternatives for that. And we design, create, develop, we engineer it. Engineering as a verb, and uh, ending up inventing and innovating things. We prototype and refine that end uh, proto pro productivity, and we end up producing solutions. And the intellectual property coming out of technological design comes in the form of patents and licenses and copyright. And where science is to know that, the technological design is to know how. Two different ways of thinking. And we end up with a magic cube of not only the disciplines and the systems, but the process. Now we have a powerful tool to design tomorrow and invent the kind of world we want. As we see how we've changed through eras here, the hunting and gathering era was a slow accumulation of know-how that through the agrarian area of growing, growing, always growing, and then the industrial one came along, and we tur turned the world right upside down on its head and uh, changed everything. Along came the information in space age, and you know, in the blink of an eye, things changed. And most people say that's where we are today, but we're not. While you and I weren't looking, we moved into the age of light, which is exponential. And as we look at it, exponential change itself is becoming exponential. All of these areas are rolling at incredible paces of change and giving us really re tremendous resources. If we're going to survive as a society on the face of this earth, we're going to have to understand the future and take a look at it because right now, every minute, there are more than 17 new breakthroughs offered up throughout the world. That's 25,000 new things every day. In fact, every year, we, there's enough new knowledge to develop to fill the Library of Congress half a million times. Have you ever imagined a time to have more tools at our discretion to work with for the future, but it's going to require a different kind of thinking to do that? And it is being handed to us. The future here on the Iron Range was because of a resource, the wheat fields, the forests, and so forth, the, land, the tra transportation through rivers. That was the resources of that time. The resources for the knowledge-based society is basically based on this area. So as Joseph Campbell says, you either claim your destiny or it will claim you. It's a knowledge-based economy then moves from data where we mine it. Huge amounts of data every day is being gathered in the databases. We mine that for information, looking for patterns and trends. And that knowledge comes about so that we know that and we know how. And out of that knowledge, we create a little wisdom and insight, and we frame possibilities for tomorrow and uh, throw in a little ingenuity and creativity and engineering design, and we come up with the opportunities. And then with uh, innovation and entrepreneurship, we can turn the dollar with it, and we experience the prosperity that comes with it. But as we look at that, the blind spot, how education is going to affect the economy and permit the inclusion to participate in it, that blind spot is an extremely critical point here in our society. Because that blind spot is this, educationally. As critical as engineering and technology are to the future of our knowledge-based economy, why is it we don't have any T and E in our STEM programs? Whatever happened to the technology and engineering in STEM? Nationwide, we're pushing for it, we're testing for it, we're teaching for it, and it's not there. 
And most people say, what happened to it? Most people don't even know it's not there. In fact, as we look at the current status of required STEM experiences in most K-12 schools across the United States, with the vertical axis looking at the grade levels and the horizontal axis looking at the STEM programs, we see that we're teaching you know, 10 to 12 years of science in our schools. We're teaching 10 to 12 years of mathematics. In fact, this summer at a school board meeting in my hometown, the uh, curriculum committee came and asked the board to add the last 12th year credit in each of these two. But this school district is just like a lot of school districts. Where is the T and the E? In most cases, we teach a little bit of computers in the elementary school, and we call it technology. That's a machine that can do some processes. And at the best, one semester in the middle school or junior high school, and that's it. Talk about out of balance and not being prepared for the future because the tree of a prosperous society in the context of a, of a growing plant, the root represents our people, the stem is the educational experience we provide to prepare for that, uh, prepare the talent, and the crown is basically the quality of life as the we experience with it. An educational experience with a strong math and science focus but less committed to technology and engineering will fail, and the choice is ours. So if we look to that, and we need a more of a balance in our science, technology, engineering, and math, and the STEM transformation will hit the bullseye when we do this. Technology and engineering basically as a system turns ideas into enterprises, it generates the jobs, it boosts the economy, it uh, sustains the competitiveness, it provides the prosperity, and it creates the wealth. And as we take a look at that, I'll give you a prime example in my community. We have a company called Wells Technology, which was founded by Andy Wells, one of my professors when I was president, who asked for a leave of absence to start this company. And he started it basically on a dime with a little over $1,000. And it is based on inclusion. Andy is a registered Red Lake native. Uh, it is a powerhouse economic developer in our community. And it is based on learning, learning, always learning with the educational program. It is an incredible program based on all of the STEM things hitting on the bullseye because it's a knowledge-based manufacturing. It is design on the fly. Don't ever become a commodity. You know, as you look at it, there's 15,000 products being sold in 54 different countries. It has 28% growth over the last four years, and it's an $83 million company today. But even more powerful is the transformation of the Wells Academy. You know, as we look at the education system of 501c3. So as we look at the stepping stones of STEM, of education, inclusion, and economy, isn't it strange that princes and kings and clowns that caper and sawdust rings and common people like you and me are builders for eternity? Each is given a bag of tools, a shapeless mass, a book of rules, and each must make our life has flown a stumbling block or a stepping stone. Thank you. Thank you.